excitement and exuberance we experience on Easter Sunday is alive and present and available every day, every hour, every second. Low Sunday? I don't think so. Because Easter keeps happening. Good morning, Uplift Church. It is a Sunday after Easter, and we're excited that you're here with us. Uh, today's going to be a very special treat, and I want you to show her some love. Miss Melia McBury, she'll be sharing from the stage today. She's preaching an awesome message today. So would y'all show her some love? Super excited about this. It's going to be a great, great, it's going to be a great day. And uh, we all, we all need prayer. We all need, we all need something uh, in, I say, in our lives. But we need to uh, relationships, we need a relationship with the Lord, we need a relationship with other people, and because there's always going to be a point in time that we are going to need the Lord, or we're going to need each other, and because we're not always at our very best. Uh, we like to think that we are, but we're not always our very best, and the, the best way I can describe that is, is that some days you don't feel like going to work, and you may, you may call in. And so uh, I work for Scott County Schools. I'm one of the computer guys, and I'm on what they call a 12-month contract, and so I get vacation days. And so uh, I was going to take off last week, just Thursday and Friday. But then Sunday night hit, and I'm like, uh, Monday's not looking too good. So I went ahead and put it like I won't be there Monday. So then Monday night hit, and I went, ah, Tuesday's not looking good either. So uh, I'm not going to put in. They said, well, you already put in for Thursday and Friday. Why not take Wednesday too? And I went, okay, let's just go ahead and do that. So I ended up taking the whole the whole week, but it was great being uh, with my family. Uh, I have some pretty awesome kids. Uh, I've got an awesome wife, and uh, I like to think that I have a great relationship with the Lord and uh, just walking with Him and talking with Him. But I don't know that I've ever questioned the Lord in such a way that I was questioning His knowledge, talents, or abilities. In, uh, in Mark... You actually can read this in all three Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but Mark r records this a little bit differently. And in Mark chapter, uh, chapter 12, there was a scribe, and a scribe is one of those that in, was a religious leader during Jesus' on earth days, and what they would do, they really knew the Scriptures. Uh, they really knew the Scriptures. Uh, they would actually even scribe them down. That's why they were called scribes. And so he came and asked Jesus a question. And he asked Jesus, he said, which is the first commandment of all? So they were talking about the law. They were talking about uh, the resurrection. And so this scribe came up and asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? And this was Jesus' answer. So a scribe came and asked Jesus a question. And here's Jesus' answer. And he said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And so the scribe asked Jesus this question, what's the greatest commandment? And we will be asking this, what, what do you need me to do? What's the one thing, God, you need me to do? And he gave two. Love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus answered the scribe. Love God, heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And here's the scribe's response. This is what he tells Jesus now, okay? He said, well, master, thou hast said truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all thy strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifice. So the scribe is telling Jesus, good job. You did answer that right. So he's telling Jesus now, you did a good job. Good job. And this is what Jesus responded to the scribe's response. So when, this is verse 34. When Jesus saw that he had answered discreetly, correctly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, and no man ask any more questions he told the scribe you're not far off you're not far off I wonder if Jesus would have a sit down conversation with us 
what would he say? And I got to really thinking, like, okay, well, then if he was not far off, then how much further did he have to go? And we often will look at people and we'll think that, man, if they are not going to heaven, then who is? We may look at somebody's lifestyle and think that they are just so on fire for God or that they have got it all together. Their family is just so picture perfect. And I'm telling you, it's a lie because no family is picture perfect. It's just an ain't. So whenever we think in our lives we're not good enough i think that's the point when he told when he told this scribe you're not far off what was the one thing that he was lacking and i think this is where we often get hung up at and it's just salvation jesus had not been to the cross yet he had not resurrected yet and they were talking about the resurrection and so you can have you can have all the right answers. We can come to church on Christmas and Easter. We can have all the right answers. But unless we have a personal relationship with Jesus, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And just because we have a personal relationship with Jesus, yes, it means that we, we are saved, we have salvation. But now what are we supposed to do? <laughs> well, it goes back to what he said at the beginning. Love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, there was another guy, he, he asked Jesus, he said, well, who is my neighbor? And he gave a big, long story about that. But basically, we're supposed to do unto others as we'd have them to do unto us. That's the way we're supposed to treat each other. So we were created to have a relationship with God and a relationship with people. A relationship with God and a relationship with people. And I don't know how your life may be going right now, but you are here to have a relationship with God and a relationship with people. And you may be hearing and thinking, well, you know, I may not be, you know, right on with God, but I'm better than so-and-so. It's not about us comparing ourselves to other people. We're supposed to be looking to one, and that is Jesus. The scribe asked him a question, and Jesus said, well, you're not far off. All you got to do is just trust me. Believe in him. That's it. Jason preached an amazing message last Sunday, an amazing message at my house all week long. We've been talking about like, subscribe, and share. It's been a conversation going on, like, subscribe, share. We even talked about that this morning, like, subscribe, share. And every time I go to YouTube and I see the like and I see, you know, the subscribe and I see that share, I'm like, man, I am never going to be able to look at YouTube the same ever again. Like, subscribe, and share. It's just such a wonderful, wonderful message. And as we continue to go through life, may we be able to do that very thing. May we not just like Jesus and be subscribed to his content, but may we continue to show others that we have been born again, that, that we are saved. And we may look at other people and think that, well, they've got it all together, but we are all in the same boat. We are all sinners saved by grace looking to one Savior, and that is Jesus. May he be the one that leads us and guides us. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to stand together. We're going to worship, and uh, right now we're going to pray for Miss Melanie and this message that God has laid upon her heart. And we're going to prepare our hearts for worship as we go to the Lord in prayer. So if y'all would, let's bow together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much uh, for this beautiful day that you've given to us. It is the Sunday after Easter. And we are excited, Father, because our relationship is not bound to you by just one day. We get to walk with you through all of life. Father, we are thankful for Resurrection Sunday. We are thankful for Easter and for what it means because of that death, hell, the grave and sin has been overcome. Jesus did that. And now we have salvation, we have hope, and we have grace, all because of him. And Father, people are looking around for truth. They're looking for love. They're looking for answers. May they be able to see your love, mercy, and grace in us by the way that we treat each other and the way that we work. May people be able to see Jesus in us father we this morning we do not take our salvation for granted we are thankful for the grace and the salvation we have through jesus and we just pray right now father that you prepare our hearts for worship and to hear a word from you we lift up melanie to you father and we ask father that your powerful spirit fill her up as she preaches from the stage today what you have laid upon her heart and father may our hearts be ready to receive it father now we lift up our voices in praise to you and may this just be a sweet, sweet song into your ears. Oh, how we love Jesus. In his name we pray.
Amen. Would you stand together and let's worship. Good morning, church. Well, I hope you are here this morning, not just here and online. We've got some family online this morning, and I know Dana and Pat and several others are out, but I hope that you're here with us, not just to check a box off, not just because you have to be or someone drug you here. I hope you're here because you really want God to change you. And if you're not, and, and even if you're here for those reasons or the wrong reasons, you're still here. So that's important, and God can still use that. But we've got to get ourselves into a mindset where you are just ready to hear from the Word of God. So let's go ahead and bow our heads really quick. I just want to say a, a Jason prayer real quick. Father God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lord, that we're here. Sometimes it is hard to get here on so many different levels. I am thankful for all those who are sitting in this church, all those who are serving back in our technology, in our kids' areas, in our preteens, those who are away from our church today, Lord, for different reasons. And Lord, all of you who are listening online, I just, I just pray, a, pray a special blessing over you this morning. And I pray that God would go ahead and be working on your heart so that you could really hear what he has to say. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, that was way longer than a Jason prayer, but we'll go with it. So there are some things that I have been thinking about over the last few weeks, and especially in light of what's going on with this revival that happened in Weber City. You know, we've seen our youth and teenagers and young adults really step up in a way that has surprised me. So you saw a lot of you, at least if you didn't attend, then you know about it, you've heard about it, you've seen things online with social media, but youth led a revival in our area, and then hundreds of people were saved and baptized, and that's awesome. We've got college things going on, Asbury College had one, I think there was another one in Kentucky in this last, this last little bit. And even our preteens, two Wednesdays ago, did a foot washing. That was just an amazing part to experience. And it really got me thinking, and as I was sitting at the revival in Weber City, that our kids are stepping up, our youth are stepping up in a way that a lot of adults don't even step out. And I don't know if you're aware, but they actually even got some criticism. Some pastors and churchgoers we're saying, you know, are they really getting saved or are they just caught up in all the drama of it? Well, shame on us. Because even if they're caught up in the drama, God can use it. God's planting seeds. God is doing a miracle. And sometimes it takes our youth and our kids to really show us what's important. I think us adults have a whole lot to learn from this, to be honest, because we are so held back by lots of reasons, by our past, our decisions, the baggage that we carry, fear, pride, there's so many things I could name off. We're held back, we stay in our seats where it's comfortable and safe, and it's the kids who are bold enough. You know, Jesus even kind of criticized the disciples at one point because they were saying, oh, no, not the kids, and, and Jesus was like, no, let the kids come. That's the kind of heart we need to have. The one where if Jesus is around, we come running. That's what we need to do. And I immediately thought when I had heard some criticism of this verse in, in Timothy, and it's Timothy 4.12, and it says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Let no one despise your youth. Let no one despise your age. A lot of times we think as youth and when we're younger, we can't, can't really do anything. We can't have as much impact. We're too young, young to serve in a lot of ways, but that is not true. You can be an example, and I've known many of an adult to get saved because their children have stronger faith. It's their children who are praying for their parents. It's their children who are an example of what we should be. So really what I wanted to share with you and tell you today is we need a personal revival. We need to take what Jason said last week, 
that like, subscribe, and share, and we need to start living it. It's not enough to like it. That's good. It might get us on the right path, but unless we are saved and we are sharing it, we are not living at church. We're just not. We can do better. We can do better as adults. And so we're going to look, and I know we've been through Easter and, and the resurrection, but I'm going to back up just a second and kind of hit some things of the crucifixion. We only have three verses that we're looking at today, so I've made it very simple. We're going to look at John chapter 19, 28 through 30. So I'm going to go ahead and just tell you the three verses so we can read them and you can get a picture of what that looks like or what's going on in the story. And then I'm going to break it down for us. So verse 28, it starts with, After this, Jesus, knowing that all the things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Sometimes we think of Easter and this story as just a story. But it is not just a story. Guys, this is our story. This is a part of your story, each one of us. If you are saved, this is a life-changing story. This is just not something we read and hope that we get something from. This is life-changing so that's what I want us to really take in as we're thinking about this. And I'm so excited for this message. I got this several weeks ago, way before I ever thought I was even going to be preaching it. And, and wait till you see what God has shown me through this. I'm, I'm really excited. So let's just dig in at verse 28. And it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Notice that he said, after this. I want to draw your attention to that. When you're studying in the Bible, it's great to just get a verse, a power verse, a daily verse, but to really understand who God is and who Jesus is, you've got to look at more than just a single verse. You've got to look at the story. And in this one in particular, something important happened right before this verse. Jesus has been hanging on the cross for hours. He is beaten and bruised, and I just want to paint a picture for you right now. He is almost to the end and he wants to take care of a few things in, in particular and I think if we have the privilege of knowing when we might pass or that it's coming or you know people who are on their deathbed so to speak and they get to say goodbye to their loved ones you know that can be a blessing and and he knows it's coming because he's God but he's also human and I love this part this is this is so human of him because right before this, and notice we're reading out of the book of John. And the crucifixion is written in all four Gospels. That's those first four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But John has a few details at the crucifixion that the other books don't have. And it's because John was standing near the foot of the cross. John wasn't just a disciple, but I believe one of, of Jesus' best friends. John even refers to himself as the one who Jesus loved. And he was standing here with Jesus' mother Mary and Mary Magdalene, who had been saved from, I think, seven demons. And John, right before that, or I'm sorry, Jesus looked at John and said, John, behold your mother, talking about Mary. And he said, Mother, behold your son. So Jesus was taking care of both Mary and John right before he passed away on the cross. That's why it says, after this. That's important. Because notice it says, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. So not only did he take care of things of his heavenly Father, all the scriptures and prophecies had been fulfilled up to this point, And he knew it. And then he took care of his mother as well. He wanted to make sure and have her taken care of by somebody that he loved. And that was going to be a good relationship. So he took care of his mom and he took care of his heavenly father. And it says in verse 29, that now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop and put it into his mouth. 
so sour wine, notice that, I mean, Jesus was offered something to drink and wine several other times during this crucifixion process, but he did not take it until now. Sour wine was different than some of the other wine he was offered. The other wine would have had alcohol in it, and it would have dulled some of his senses in the pain that he was feeling. So they believe that he didn't take it for that reason. But he did take it here. So sour wine was used as a poor people's drink. And in addition to that, it's actually, it's, it's not really sour, it's vinegar. It's a vinegar wine, so it's extremely bitter. But it says he's so thirsty here. It says, I thirst. There's something about the crucifixion that you may not know. And not only is it extremely painful, because you, you would be hanging, and he had his hands nailed to the weight of his body. In addition, he's had all this blood loss. When he was whipped, it wasn't just with a regular whip. There was, I think, 38 or 39 lashes with a cat of nine tails. And so that is a whip with what seems like nine tails, nine things coming off of it. And on the end of those are pieces of metal. And so when you whip, it catches the skin, and then it just rips it off. So he's lost an extreme amount of blood. And then hanging up there for hours in the dry, in the heat, he is going to be extremely thirsty. And it's not, remember that everything that's written in God's word has a purpose. So not only is he actually thirsty because of the slow, painful death that a crucifixion is, it's because he knows what's about to happen. He needs to say something, but he can't do it not only being so thirsty, but his mouth is probably extremely dry. We know how we get when we've been working outside and our mouth just gets almost like you just can't say much clearly because cotton mouth is what some people call it because you, you just don't have anything to wet your palate. So he knew, I've got to say these words. So he asked for something to drink. It had a purpose. And imagine the strength that it's going to take because another part of this crucifixion, and this is why they put that piece of wood underneath their feet, not just to nail it, but it's to prolong this agony. It's to make sure that you don't die too quickly so that you suffer. Because he's on that piece of wood, and in order to catch a breath or say anything, they have to take their strength and lift themselves up because you're almost suffocating from the amount of pressure and pain that your body is putting on itself from hanging there. So he took this drink and he gathered this strength and he lifted himself up to say his last and final words. Notice in verse 20 said, it says, Jesus knowing that all scripture was fulfilled. Well, he knew it. But the people there, the people that would go and write the Bible, because remember that a lot of the things that were written down are, are things that pass through word of mouth or through witnesses. So he wanted to make sure and say these words so that they knew that it really was finished. Some Romans, some other people hearing it, probably just thought he meant that I'm about to die. That's why he said it is finished. But it is not just that. So in verse 30 it says, When Jesus had received the wine, he said, and this is the only gospel that records what he actually said. Now Matthew does say he cried out in a loud voice. Matthew was a tax collector, a disciple, so he would most likely have been there. But he might not have been close enough like John was to actually hear what the words were. And the other two Gospels don't record it at all. So here John says what he heard, and he said, It is finished. So imagine that being cried out for someone who is hanging on the cross. And some people could have thought, like, it is just him who's going to die, but that's not what it is, guys. He is saying that it is finished because he is talking about all the things that he came to do on earth. That's what's finished. All the things that he came to do for us. But I love this, because, and, and he knew it, so he, he yells out, it's finished, 
And at that moment, it says in verse 30, bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Then the earth begins to shake. And the temple gets a complete crack. The foundation was shaken. And the veil that separates. So if you're in the temple in this day and time, a regular person could not walk into the temple and go and meet God or pray. There's a veil that separated God's presence from everyone else. You had to go through a, a priest or a Pharisee or whatever they called them then. But when Jesus died, this miraculous thing happened. And he told them it was going to, but they didn't understand. So this massive curtain is split completely in two. And now we have the opportunity since Jesus' death, to actually have a personal relationship with God. We can talk to him every single moment of the day or night. We can pray about anything that's on our minds. We wouldn't have been able to do that before. So Jesus removed the separation between us and God. You know, and even last year, uh, during the Easter message, I had said, you know, if you can imagine the cross with God on one side and us on the other, that Jesus actually connected us to it. And, and I think it's awesome. So what it was, when he says it is finished, yes, scripture is fulfilled. But it is also all of our sin, past, present, and future. That's what it is. All of that's gone. God will remember it no more when you're saved. It is also, please catch this, don't miss this, please. It is whatever hinders us from having a real relationship with him. It is what is standing in our way, our obstacle, that is keeping us from really being all in, from having that revival, from being sold out. And it might be that you have several it's, let's be honest. But there is an it. And so when he's hanging on the cross, it's real personal. He is saying it is finished in your life, whatever that thing happens to be. So I want you to really think, what is your it? And I've listed some things here that God just brought to my mind? Is it addiction? Is that your it? Is that, what, is that what's keeping you from being sold out? Is it a broken marriage? Is it sickness and pain right now? And this is going to look differently at different parts of your life. Is it mental illness? Is it the broken home and trauma that you come from? Is that your it? Is that, is that what your hang-up is? Is it jealousy? Money? Self-centeredness. Because we all have an it, guys. And I was even thinking of just looking at the Bible, Judas, who betrayed one of the disciples in the elite group, in, in Jesus' close group of people. Judas had an it, and it was greed. And that is what kept him from really knowing Jesus. Peter, even though he was also a disciple, and I think we could put ourselves in these situations. We're all disciples, but we still have things. So Peter's would have been fear. And you can see it several times in the Bible when he goes out to walk on water and he sinks because of fear. When he's called out three different times after Jesus is arrested and he denies him, it was because of fear. Saul, who eventually became Paul, his was hatred. He hated Christians so much that he killed them. He tortured them. He sought them out. But then God used it for good. So what is your it? Because it, it can be a prison. It can be painful. It can consume your thoughts and take over your life if you let it. And that is exactly what the devil wants. He wants to find your it and exploit it so that you cannot have that relationship with Jesus and so that you can definitely not share it with other people. But God says no. He says it's finished. 
Church, just repeat that with me. It is finished. Jesus took care of it. So that's where we have to live. So what are we going to do with it? And this is the part I'm, I'm super excited for. I'm not smart enough to come up with this stuff. So when God gives me stuff like this, I'm like, yes. Okay, I've not actually practiced with this marker. So <clears throat> I had to steal Salem's easel and her canvas this morning out of her bedroom. She's like, why are you taking that? I'll return it. It's fine. What are we going to do with it? That's the big question. This is so simple and so good. So I... I'm like PJ drawing up here. He's probably better. It, what am I going to do with it? I am going to take it to the cross. That's what you do with it. You take it to the cross. Where he already took care of it. Where it's already been solved for you. But what you have to do is take it there. Notice in verse 30, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you respond in how you want to, but I, I want to share one other thing with you. In verse 30 it says that in bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This was not a exhausted slump after passing away and giving up his spirit. Notice it happened before that. When you bow your head to somebody, like as you're passing or as there's a procession, when you bow your head on purpose, it's a sign of reverence. This specific word has a purpose in this verse. Jesus chose to bow his head to God before he gave up his spirit. So he was being an example of, of exactly what we need to do. When we take it to the cross, there's a reason sometimes pastors say, you know, why don't you come and bow down at the altar? Jesus was our example for this, even on a cross hanging and exhausted. When he had completed everything he needed to do, he still, out of reverence and respect for his father, he bowed his head before he left this earth. And we can do the same. So if you have an it that is just really overwhelming you today, that you just need to lay down so that you can have freedom from it, that's what I would encourage you to do. And there's just something about being able to go to an altar so that you can leave it there instead of just doing it in your seat. And you're welcome to do it. It doesn't matter where you are. You can do it in your car on the way out. But there is something about just coming and letting it go that God wants us to do. And then we have people who are here that can pray with you. And we don't have to know what it is because you know what your it is. God already knows what your it is. And I just want to remind you before we play this song that it is finished and finished means ended, completed. It's lost its power. But as long as you hold on to it, it still has it. So my question is, are you finished with it? Saprina, if you'll just play, or Saprina and Dave, if you'll play a song for us. And I'll just let you respond how God is leading you to. If you'll just go ahead and stand to your feet. Maybe you just need prayer over something. The altar is open. Let's just bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for just your words and your message and how every part of your story is an example to what we need to do. Father, thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. But Lord, we have so many different it's in our lives, things that are just holding us back, things that are just separating us from your love, things that we've been holding on to for way too long. 
things that are just holding us captive that we just can't seem to break free from. You know what these are, Lord, and I just pray for each person here and the it or its that they have, that, God, you would just let them walk forward and bow at your cross because this is where you took care of it. It is finished. Lord, I just pray that we can live in that every single day, that we wake up, that we go and we get discouraged and we want to pick it right back up, but that, God, you were crucified on the cross for this very particular thing because you love this person so much that you died on the cross for this for this it was in your mind you knew it father thank you for taking care of this jesus name we pray and then i cried dear jesus Come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow you may not even know what your it is. Maybe you can't name it. Maybe you're just in a place where it is just really hard to even talk to God. Where you have a lot of sickness and pain and it's hard to think about anything else because of it. Pray God that you would just come and let him do what only he can. Don't walk out the same as you came in. Beyond the crystal sea, hope of the angels singing. Maybe you have not accepted Jesus into your heart. Whether that's online or in here, I, I pray that before you leave, you would do that. Before you would just turn off whatever you're listening to it on. And it's, it's very simple. It's that you know that Jesus died on the cross for you and you know that you're a sinner and you ask God into your heart. It's that simple. bow your head as people finish up Lord we just thank you for your word we thank you that we have hope we thank you God that you care about each and every single detail of our entire lives Father thank you for sending your son to die on the cross Lord and I'm reminded God that there's people who are losing their children every day and I just cannot imagine the pain that he had to endure that I would have that that I helped cause father thank you that you died for all of our sins past present and future and you know every single one of our flaws but that we want to do better and be better Lord cleanse our hearts help us to hear you help us to be able to think about you as we rise up and as we go to bed put people and things in our path that are going to draw us closer to you. And all those things that stand against us and all those obstacles and all those it's, Lord, I just pray just the power of Jesus over those things. Do what only you can, Lord. Father, we thank you for each person here and all that they're going to face this week. You already know and you're already preparing a way. Help us to live in it. 
And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.